Fatherhood is the most difficult thing I've done in life. After 11 years, some days, I still feel like I don't have a clue. The game changes every day, and sometimes by the hour. So how do other guys do it? I'm Brett Farrell, and in this series I'll be talking with fathers to see how they navigate this thing called fatherhood. In this episode, we talk to Reverend Matt Steadman, the Senior Minister at St Bede's Dremoyne, a growing parish in Sydney's Inner West. We'll be talking all the F words, faith, fatherhood and future. What's one item you now own as a father that you never thought you would, but for having children? A device that attaches to our stroller, which holds two coffee cups. <laughs> that is genius. Matt's married to an amazingly creative woman. He's one of six children, the son of a church-going surfer, and is the father of three. Roxy, who's seven, Mason, four, and Ezra, two, with baby number four on the way. You know, I'm, I'm not really prepared for, for baby number four yet. It's understandable that Matt is a little shy about the upcoming birth as baby number three came pretty fast, with Matt delivering him at home on the living room floor. It, it all just seemed a little bit too easy. So for those of you who are engaging with obstetricians, I say to you, don't, it's not that hard. <laughs> so that's not medical advice. That's <laughs> Matt has an environmental science degree, a Bachelor of Divinity, and a willingness to be open and honest. Well, I certainly didn't come here to, expecting to share this, so well, no. well done in digging it out of me. You're welcome. Uh, I, I think men being real with men is incredibly important. You're listening to Fatherhood with Brett Farrell. And here is the Reverend Matt Steadman. Hello, Matt. Brett, good to be with you. So there's something I haven't mentioned about Ezra's birth. Now, apparently, you were involved at both ends of that pregnancy. So tell me about that. It, it all just seemed a little bit too easy. So for those of you who are engaging with obstetricians, I say to you, don't. It's not that hard. So <laughs> that's not medical advice. <laughs> it was one of those occasions where I just sort of had to say to myself, Matt, you've got to rise to the occasion. There, there's no one else here to help. There's no one else coming. I walked outside and I was like a madman, pacing up and down the driveway, shouting at the sky or, you know, shaking my fist at, into the ether, saying, where is the ambulance? And eventually, seven minutes later, it arrives. And then they said to me, they come inside, they said, Matt, would you like to cut the umbilical cord? And I said, mate, once you've delivered a child, cutting the umbilical cord, come on, it's a little beneath it. How did you find out you're going to be a father? How did I find out? Well, I mean, Emily took a pregnancy test. Uh, I don't know if that's too obvious, but and said, you know, we're we're pregnant, or I'm having I'm having a baby, and obviously we embraced and we were super thankful to God, and uh, we had had a miscarriage before then, so that was, uh, you know, extra extra thankful uh, that that this seems like it was a more robust pregnancy. And yeah, that's how we found out. And then we waited, you know, the three months, started telling family and friends. And it was just a, a really joyous occasion. Did my life change there? Yeah, I think it does. It, it slowly, slowly, incrementally changes as as, uh, as you start nesting and preparing the house and there's bodily changes and all those sorts of things. Uh, as you start shopping for strollers and things that you never actually considered until you actually go into the, the, the baby store. Matt, just on... The miscarriage you mentioned, more men I speak to confess that they've had a miscarriage. It's, it's, I was amazed how common it is, but no one talks about it. How did you cope? Who did you turn to? Well, Emily and I wept for a while. So we were super sad because we were super excited about having a baby and we had been trying to have a baby. And then when the miscarriage happened uh, we wept and then I really wanted to tell my mum and dad and so I remember sitting down in the lounge room and and um, telling them mum and dad and they wept we all wept together and then we moved on but I think speaking to someone telling someone is it's just like a, a release valve of pressure uh, so that's that's how we dealt with it. I'm not sure exactly whether who Emily spoke to about it. I think she spoke to her sister. And they're quite close. But yeah, my my uh, I wanted to tell mum and dad. Fatherhood is a voyage into the unknown, 
We have no idea what to do, aside from a few books that we're reading. There's lots of practical advice about raising children, but not about being a dad. Despite this, we keep going back for more. Three kids, one on the way. Mm. You must know something about fatherhood we don't. I wouldn't put it like that, to be honest. I, I just think Em and I learn on the job. We just keep learning as, as, we go, as we go along. But one of the principles we do operate under is doing the hard yards early and reaping the rewards later. We're firm with our kids. We're loving and firm. I sort of liken it to holding a bar of soap. You hold it firmly. Mm -hmm. If you squeeze too tightly, it's likely to leave your hand and hit you in the forehead. So we hold it firmly, uh, but not too firm. And that's what, that's the, I guess, the posture we take with, with our, our children. But that's really interesting. So tell us about that when you add more to the collection. You know, I'm, I'm not really prepared for, for baby number four yet. And that might sound really odd, but I think, again, we'll just adapt as uh, my son, he is a boy coming, arrives. I think the children almost become more well-rounded earlier as they engage with more people. I mean, that's, that's what life is really about, engaging with other people, adapting, learning social etiquettes and social skills and, and that sort of thing. And I can see my youngest, Ezra, is a little bit more rounded, uh, robust, perhaps even resilient. How is it that the younger, the younger child, do you feel, becomes more rounded? Is it because the older children are around to whip him into shape, as it were? Well, I mean, when I think about Roxy, my, my firstborn, there are more photos of her, there are more videos of her and, and that sort of thing. Of Ezra, there's, there's less of those because, of course, your attention is, is divided. Now, I, I heard someone say once that your, your love isn't divided, it's multiplied as, as the children come along, and I, I fully agree with that. But your attention is somewhat more divided. So Ezra will be crying a little longer in the cot before we get to him than Roxy was. I mean, one peep out of her and both of us would be on the side looking over, wondering what we could do. Since becoming a father, I see the world around me changing quickly. The things my children are facing didn't exist when I was a child. It made me wonder, how do you prepare your children for a future when you don't know what that future looks like? But what do you imagine the world will be like? And because you got the age ranges are staggering and even with the pace of change now you can see what the world was like seven to ten years ago is not what the world was like two years ago versus who knows so how what, what does the world look like in the future for you as a father what do you hope for well what i think the world might be and what i hope for are very different things well my my answer to that question is to help them realize that the great hope of the kingdom of God is that a better day is coming. Not to put too much expectation on the here and now, which I never think can satisfy. I don't think any spouse, I don't think any job or any possession or any experience or any breakthrough is going to give us what our hearts really want. What our hearts really want is to be loved, genuinely loved. And I think only Christ can give that to us. And we're only going to experience that. We experience it now in part, but we're going to experience fully when we see him face to face. So for me, uh, my, one of the roles of, of fatherhood for me is to just be really, not to be pessimistic, not to be optimistic, but to be realistic about life. To tell my kids there are so many great things about the creation. Um, relationships and, and experiences and travel and food and all, all sorts of things. But just manage your expectations because they will let you down. And already, Roxy's had some experiences at school with little friends, seven-year-old friends, and there's been uh, some little trials and tribulations that she's gone through, and I think that's an excellent thing for her to start to understand that life is not a bed of roses, but there's forgiveness and there's grace and there's mercy and there's a better day coming. Do you ever feel then overwhelmed by the influence that you have on your children? Uh, I think the short answer to that is yes. Uh, I, I mean, you, you start to see children from a young age copying mannerisms, copying, cop, copying language, uh, idiom, that sort of thing that happens in the family unit. And when you see that, it's almost like looking in a mirror and not particularly liking what the reflection is showing you. So, yeah, I do, I am concerned about the influence. It's a double-edged sword for me. It's, it's brilliant, it's a gift from God to, uh, to influence, and I think that's the role that a parent has. And, but also, you know, it's, you know, there's pros and cons with that. I mean, they pick up the good and the bad. 
And even as I reflect on, on my upbringing, I'm, whilst I remain tremendously thankful to, to mum and dad in shaping me to be the person, the man I am now, there are things that travel down you know, generational lines that I now have inherited and I need to deal with as, as, a, as a man, as a husband, and as a father, and as a church pastor. I think that's absolutely fundamental. Matt's faith is evident in his parenting advice, but I wondered if he ever feels like I do, that some days I'm failing in areas of my fatherhood. This might be naive, but I think, I think my children are too young to show up the failures of my fatherhood. Uh, I will see the failures of my fatherhood probably further down the track. I think probably mid-teens and, and forward. They will be exhibiting, I don't know, traits or behaviours that I have directly influenced, which they will need to carry on in their, into their adult life. So I think it's a little early to, to identify that. Okay, maybe too early to identify, but how do you prepare us as fathers then? Because. I, you know, as a father, I can see I can I can mess up every day, and it's it's quite clear right in my face when I've messed up every day. I had never even thought about the idea that I could be messing up now, not seeing it until, you know, 10, 15 years down the line. So whether it's today or down the line, but how can we prepare for perhaps the inevitable? Well, firstly, just a, an understanding and appreciation and acceptance. That, that it will happen, that none of us are perfect, that there will be things that rub off on our children that we're not happy with. Uh, that's just par for the course, that, that's human nature. We're all fallen creatures. And unfortunately, some of those things will travel into our children and they will carry them into their marriages and, and into their, their children. How you actually deal with them, I, you know, I, I don't want to sound like a, a um, I'm just beating the same drum over and over, but it's all about the gospel. You know, as fathers, I think we need to. I think we need to realise that that God is in the business of transformation by His Word and by His Spirit, and we need to take that very seriously. Not okay. just for not just for the sake of the glory of God, but for the sake of our children. But let, let's break that down a bit, because you know, you're a reverend. Your faith's obviously going to influence your life journey and your fatherhood. You've just said that God's in the business of transformation. So why don't we just break that down? What, what does the scripture tell us about being fathers? What can we learn about this? Well, listen, there's a number, I mean, fatherhood is a massive concept in the scriptures. I mean, it's, it's all about the fatherhood of, of God and, and God at being a father and giving his son. Uh, but more specifically, there are some verses that are relevant to me when it comes to, to being a father and, and what that actually looks like. The first one is Deuteronomy chapter six, Israel has just received received the law uh, and Moses says uh, talk about it with your families talk about what it, talk about it with your children talk about it as you walk along the road what it actually means how it impacts your life and the reason I like that is because there's an infusion there's not a um, there's not a section of life over here with a label on it religion or faith or Christianity and a, and a, and a box here uh, that says school and a box here that's extracurricular and it's there's this seamless integration in the old covenant of how the law was to impact life and the reason I picked that up is because where my kids are and what stage they're at we do talk about God as we walk along the road what does that look like though because you know I think I think for fathers and men we you know look, if fatherhood came with an instruction manual we still wouldn't read it what does talking about it along the road look like? I'll give you an example. Talk about it. Yeah, Show us how you do it. I walked at the kids to school, uh, Roxy to school, Mason to preschool, a couple of days a week, and we will regularly stop and look at. I'm quite quite interested in plant biology. We will we will look at uh, either some ants running along the ground or a, a flower, a passion fruit flower, and look at the intricate design and talk about, wow, what what genius created that? Isn't God amazing? Or even more simple than that, oh, what a beautiful day. Let's, let's thank God for that. Or as we walk to school, Lord, bless Roxy today. Help her to love, learn and lead. Whatever, whatever prayer we want to pray, Lord, be with Mace today. Bless him. So we, we've, I've tried to seamlessly integrate our faith into uh, the raising of our kids. So uh, we all know, the whole family knows, when we get in the car, the first thing we do is we pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Keep us safe as we travel on the road. Uh, it's brilliant because the kids can't escape. 
uh, they're strapped into their seats. So it's you know a little tip there for those taking notes. Uh, but you know after after dinner we read the Bible together. They, kids love Q and A. At this age, it all change, and we'll adapt to that. You know, okay, I said that at the beginning of the interview. We, we kept adapting and changing, and, uh, and there's and then we prayed. And I said, what are we thanking God for today, guys? Pajamas, bed, lollies, toys, garbage trucks, whatever, whatever it is, that's what we're thanking God for. There's no wrong answer to that question. That's the brilliance of it. The simplicity of teaching faith is refreshing. But as Matt said, life is not a bed of roses and we all have our ups and downs. While the what and how to be a father has changed over the generations and now being more open to talking about our feelings, I can't help wonder if, like me, there are areas of fatherhood that Matt finds uncomfortable. So vulnerability for men is always going to be an issue. And let's get a bit vulnerable. What moments have scared you being a father? That was a, a good question. There was one moment where I was frustrated at something. It came out in a physical way, my frustration. I kicked a ball that was in my way. And that was, I mean, it sounds so trivial, but it was probably one of the first times that my frustration or anger exhibited in a physical action rather than an internal emotional reaction. And that took some, um, some soul searching. Like, what led to that? Why did I respond like that? Did the kid see that? No, the kid wasn't actually involved in the, I had walked away from the situation. I, I, I think the kid was still somewhere else. So no, the kid didn't see it. That's sometimes how frustrated I, I get or how angry I get proportionate to the offence is something that I've had to reflect on after the event. Okay, so let, let's just back up mm. to the ball, the manifestation of physical anger and frustration. I'm going to go out on a limb here. I reckon every father's there, been there probably more than once. What do you learn on the soul search? What do we need to know about that? I mean, it's obviously an issue, probably not the best response, probably a common response. But how do we deal with that? What did you learn in your soul searching that may help? Mate, what do you learn from a one-off? I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't like it was a pattern of behavior. No, it not, but it stopped you. It was enough to stop you. What scared me about it was, I hope that doesn't happen again. And I hope that I would never show a violent action towards another individual let alone a helpless ball. So that's what, it, that's what really stopped me, thinking if that wasn't a ball, if that was a human being, if that was my child, would I, and I was, and they were in my way, would I have, you know, what if, was, was what scared me. And so for me it was, I need to think about anger as an issue. I need to pray about this and I need to be very careful. For me, dealing with stress is a lifestyle question and it leads me to sleep, diet and exercise and I guess prayer as well. But there, So for me it was a managing of, of the build up of, of stress, be it at work or at home. I think a lot of fathers will feel stress of all kinds, job related, perhaps things aren't as great at home as you'd hope. Sleep, diet and exercise, bit of prayer. Is there anything else we can do? I, 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 the reason I'm, I, I'm, st I'm sick at sticking here is because I think it's really important. And I think it's probably more common than anyone ever talks about or anyone ever. Well, I certainly didn't come here to, expecting to share this. So well, no. well done in digging it out of me. You're welcome. We talked a bit of, earlier about vulnerability. Yeah. Men being real with men is incredibly important. What needs to happen in churches is, is an intimacy between one another needs to grow. A bandhood, a brotherhood, band of brothers. Something uh, more than a small group. Oh, yeah, I would say so. I think men in particular, women as well, but I think men need other men to ask them, how's your anger? How are you really going? How's your drinking going? You know, and all sorts of other lifestyle questions. And if you've got one or two of those people who can hold you to account, who can pray for you, who can show you grace, who can point you to where we're actually heading as believers and the lives that we influence. I mean, we influence not only our wives, our families, but people at work in our community. I think that's absolutely fundamental. Getting it right, whatever that is, it's the most difficult thing in fatherhood. 
Matt continually speaks of community, not being alone. Clearly, faith guides his relationships and how he fathers. We spoke about this metaphor you use about having a firm grip on the soap. If you squeeze mm. it too much, it slips mm. out of your hands. Mm. Bringing the balance between discipline and fun with the kids, I, I actually really struggle with that. How should we manage getting the soap right? Like, How, how do you discipline your kids in well, a way that gets a result but doesn't crush them? It's always hard like when you're having a wrestle and then they hit you with a fist in the face. And it's, almost, it's gone from fun to discipline <laughs> in the blink of an eye. How do you get it right? Oh, you know, you call it out early. It's usually time out. It's, it's time out. And then once the time out is, is finished, and it's really helpful. I mean, time out, I think, only works with extroverted kids because the introverted are probably really happy to be shut in a room with a book for a while. But my kids are quite extroverted and they want to be out where the action is. So it's time out. And then we usually talk, talk it through. You know, what, why did we put you into time out? What, what do you think went wrong there? We would really appreciate it if, if you didn't behave like that again. And like I said earlier, you do the hard yards early, you put boundaries in place. I think our kids know what's expected of them and, and what's not. You don't take a sledgehammer to a walnut, a small fence. You sort of, you can brush aside, you can give a warning, but after two or three times, then you go, actually, we've warned you about this. You know, God has put us here and obeying mum and dad is actually something that God wants you to do. So we, we would appreciate it if, if you did that. Now, that all sounds very level-headed and, and rational. There mm-hmm. are times where you just yell at the kids. Yeah. It's just like, I have told you three times to pick that up yeah. in that tone. That's what, you know, that's... Is that yelling? No, but I... Come to our house. <laughs> I'll show you yelling at the kids. I've, I've heard it from mine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, there, there is yelling that goes on. I don't think that's the best, but... That happens. And you know what? You, you try and learn from that and you try and be a calm presence. I guess we could also pick scriptures out of the Bible that talk about fatherhood. Ephesians comes to mind. Mm. Don't exasperate your children, for mm. example. And, and there's probably others we could just pick out of the air. And, I, you know, maybe they serve a purpose. Maybe they're helpful. Maybe they guide us in some way. But do you think the pictures, there's a much bigger picture in scripture for fathers than just maybe some memory verses? It's funny you mention Ephesians because I think more important than that is Ephesians 5. The reason I take you to Ephesians 5 is because one of the first things it says is husbands love your wives. And I think that's something that every father can bless his children. That One of the ways he blesses his children is by loving their mother. That's one of the most important things that a father can do, to demonstrate to the kids that you love mum and mum and dad are tight, and mum and dad are on the same team or on the same page. Sometimes kids will see mum and dad fighting and disagreeing. So important for kids to see the reconciliation process, the asking for forgiveness, the praying together, whatever whatever it involves. So I think that comes before not exasperating children is husband, love your wife as Christ loved the church. That's really important. So in some respects, it's not necessarily a father-child issue. It's more about a husband-wife issue first. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, your wife, the, the spouses make promises to one another. There's no promise to your children. And, and I mean, it's it's mum and dad first. And the children come after that. You know, that, that's the biological reality of things. But I also think that that's important to demonstrate to the, to the children that mum and dad uh, have made promises to each other. We're on the same page because very early on they learn about separation and divorce. And, you know, questions like, are you going to get divorced? Uh, how do we know that you're still going to love mummy in five years' time? Other questions. How do they know? How do you, how do you answer that? Uh, I, I answer, well, mum, I just want to reassure you, Rox, that mum and dad do love each other and we've made promises to each other and we work very hard to make sure that we continue to love each other and so that's not going to happen. That's what we say. Okay. And yeah. she accepts that now. Hey, seven. Seven, yeah. She knows a number of her friends. Uh, I mean, she came in the other day and said, oh, didn't you know, did you know that so-and-so has two mums? I said, oh, what, what, what are we talking about there? She goes, oh, a stepmum and a biological mum. I said, ah, okay. So we don't have to have that conversation yet. Not yet. <laughs> You're leading a parish, mm. lots of young families in your area. Oh, but plenty. Yeah. Plenty. And, yeah. and some of them come to church, some of them you hope would come to church. What's the best bit of advice you've ever been given about fatherhood? I think it's love their mother 
you don't want to underestimate the importance of the mum and dad loving one another and loving their children in, in the family unit. I mean, that's what the family unit is built upon, mum and dad coming together and producing children. The most important thing is to love their mother so that as a team, mum and dad, you can demonstrate what it is for Christ to love the church and therefore you can, you're in a, a very solid place to, to love the children. That was Matt Steadman's take on fatherhood. It's more than a relationship with the kids. It's loving his wife and having a band of brothers, a community around him for support. Matt admits that he may not have all the answers, but he did share some foundational theology to help us along the way. I hope that you gain some valuable ideas and tips, and I would love you to join me as I continue to chat to fathers, expanding my dad's skills and navigating my way through fatherhood. As your children get older, they get more sentient and want to make their own decisions. And that's all part of growing up and perfectly normal. But some of the choices, particularly in clothing, my daughter came out in some denim shorts, more hot pants, not to the knees, and a, and a like a leotard top, and said, oh, can I wear this to church? <laughs> okay, well, you've answered the question. No, I just find it funny. I can relate to that. I mean, Roxy's got a Halloween disco coming up. And so Em and I had to talk about whether Roxy's allowed to go to the Halloween disco. We said, you could, but you can't dress as something scary. How about you go as an angel? She says, well, Satan's an angel. Can I go as Satan? (laughs) No, you need to go as a good angel, not a fallen angel. (laughs) You said she was seven. Yeah. Okay, good luck with that, Matt. Thank you to the show's producer, Loretta Farrell, and to Philip, Dwayne, Derek and Michelle at Hope Media, and Matt for letting us tell his story. I'm Brett Farrell, and this is Fatherhood.